And we are back on the Falcons Audible presented by at and I'm Derek Rackley with my guys. Little bit different formation. You know, we do talk about formations a lot in football. Yeah. Dave Archer right here to my left. And DJ Shockley is to my left as well, but he's like way left, like way down the road left because he's got some other job responsibilities, but nothing's too important to miss the Falcons Audible. That's DJ, it. thanks for joining us here via your... Um, device i mean you used to always say like computer or laptop but now it's not like that we anymore we just got shock in the shotgun where That's he it. needs to be That's he's it. directing traffic from the shotgun, shock there you go. shotgun. I like that so we yeah. are ready to shoot some snaps back to shock as we talk about the initial 53 man roster as it is hot off the press arthur smith and terry fontenot have just released their initial 53 man roster so here's what we're going to cover today it's going to be a lot about roster construction we're going to talk about uh first reactions any surprises that the guys see from this first roster why we call it an initial roster and any potential additions that end up going on top of this and then of course strength and weaknesses as we get ready next weekend to start off week one against the new orleans saints so let's get some initial reactions here shock i'm going to start with you because you're the furthest away and i want you to feel involved i want you to feel right in the <laughs> middle of this thing give us your first reactions of what you thought when you got to look at the first 53 man roster you know you first look at it man uh, obviously there are a lot of things that you, you know you, you go to first and i think for me uh the number one thing i went to actually was the receiver group and there was a lot of talk we had that talk last week about who would be that last receiver would it you know be frank darby would it be uh the the, the guy that everybody's been talked about in jared bernhardt and as soon as i saw his name you know it was a sense of wow i mean that's a, a pretty cool accomplishment to be able to go out and make a roster being an undrafted free agent, a guy who's done a lot of winning in his time, but end up coming in and winning a job on this team where, you know, it was a, you know, a total where we, we want to go out and see what these receivers are about. And I thought him going out and winning a job, I thought was, was really cool. Um, a great story, obviously. Uh, and he can help you in a lot of different ways. He's a guy that, you know, did a lot of good things in preseason and thought he was well deserving uh, of that particular uh you know, spot on the on, on the roster. Uh, on the defensive side of the ball, obviously, D. Offer played well, a guy that we thought would be a part of uh, this team. We saw him do some first-team nickel, be a part of that first-team group uh, ladder in the part of this uh, preseason. But I thought a guy like Abdullah Anderson, who, you know, kind of stuck out a little bit in the last couple of preseason games, really made a, a strong push to be a part of this ball club. So to see him not on the team or not on an initial 53-man roster was a little bit surprising. But uh, this was – uh, a team that I thought throughout the year, I mean, throughout the preseason, we thought was, you know, could be a lot of surprises here and there, but those were the two that really stuck out for me. Dave, how about you? What what was some of your first reactions when you looked at all the names that were here or that were left off? Well, really not to not to repeat what Shock said. I think Shock touched on a lot of the guys that we were following. I thought Abdullah Anderson was a bit of a surprise for me. Shock mentioned that, so I don't need to revisit that. I thought Nathan Landman landing a job at the linebacker spot was a big deal. Um, Dorian Etheridge got hurt a little bit. Uh, did that have some effect on it? That landman was outstanding. I thought he had pressure. He put pressure on the quarterback a number of times. He was in where he was supposed to be in tackling the football, uh, sideline to sideline guy. So um, we had we had mentioned, you know, there could Nick uh, Kwiatkowski was a guy they brought in, a veteran player that had come in. Did he have a chance to make the team? Well, Nathan Landman as a kid is a free agent uh, rookie uh, out of Colorado. And I, I remember talking to Terry Fontenot, and I said – Terry, you know, after watching that first game against the Lions, I said, wow, this Landman kid, he goes, hey, he just stopped me. He says, you go put his tape on at Colorado. It is a fun tape mm -hmm. to watch. So this was a guy that kind of caught their eye coming in, and he proved it. That's always fun. And Shock and I, you can all, t we can tell the fan out there, this is a big deal to make. Now, this is the initial 53. Let's yep. not get too caught up in, hey, these are the guys that are going to line up a, a week from Sunday and yep. play the Saints. Because it could change because we know there's 31 other teams that are releasing players yep. that put, potentially could fit here. But certainly coming out of Tuesday, all the cuts being done for now, it's a pretty cool deal. And Nathan Nathan Landman is that probably that guy that Shock didn't mention that would fit in that category of the guys he talked about. Dave, let me come back to you and ask you a little bit about your thoughts on the running backs because there was a couple names. Obviously, Caleb Hunt, Huntley and Kadri Allison did not make the initial 53-man roster 
Did you think that that was going to happen? I mean, you got a running back group now that, you know, there's generally what, four, five, maybe six spots if you hold a fullback like the Falcons do for special teams or some different sub packages. But any surprise that either of those two didn't make it? Or did you kind of see that with Algier being drafted, those guys were going to be the odd men out? It was a tall order to try to make. That was probably the most crowded room, right, guys? Yeah. Probably if you looked at the rooms but when camp began, the, the running back room, having drafted Algier, you knew he was going to be a guy that was going to be here, and he showed he deserves maybe to be your starter. CP, his multidimensional. And then Damian Williams, the guy that they brought in, they really liked him. We didn't see a lot of him, in, in but he has some sweat equity already in the league, right? He's a guy that's proven himself that he can make plays in the league. So now all of a sudden, you're three deep already. So now where else do you go with the running back room? And now I'm looking for versatility. And there's no question that the versatility uh, is going to come from Damian or from uh, from Avery Williams. Mm-hmm. Avery is a guy that returns kicks. He can play corner. He actually took snaps, guys. I don't know if you saw the shock at practice last week. He took corners in the he took corner snaps in the combined practice against Jacksonville. That's the versatility you're getting with him. Return punts, play running back, that third down stuff. And oh, by the way, we get banged up. We plug him <laughs> in a corner. More you can do, right, Shock? Oh, no doubt about it. Hey, Shock, let me ask you this question. It's interesting that Dave mentions versatility because when you look at how Atlanta sends out their initial 53-man roster, it starts with quarterbacks, right? And it says Marcus Mariota and Desmond Ritter. And then under tight ends, it says Felipe Franks. So you mentioned versatility. I feel like it's kind of a two-for-one shock with Felipe Franks, obviously working a lot at tight end during training camp, but also playing a little bit at quarterback. So they got basically a guy that they can use on special teams, maybe if they get into a pinch with an injury or something like that, and they've got a third-string quarterback on their roster suited up every week. Right, that's spot on. I mean, you guys just mentioned the more you can do is always better. We talk about it on every position on this football team. If you're versatile enough to play not just one position, but you can have to play two or three positions, that makes you so valuable to this team. And we saw Felipe Franks throughout preseason go from tight end, then he'll go back and he'll run the two-minute drill at quarterback. Just having that versatility and a guy that can actually help you is a big thing. Felipe did a good job. I think this preseason of being able to catch the football in space, he's a big body guy. And then we forget about that third phase of the game. We've seen Felipe a few number of times last year. He actually was the, the punt protector. Yep. There's so many yep. things that he can do in, in both those two phases of the game that can help you. So having a guy like that who can help you on Sundays, but also if something happens to one of your quarterbacks, can step in there and be a viable guy for you is huge. So I think Felipe did a great job of – you know, coming into this camp saying, okay, well, maybe you don't see me as the prototypical quarterback, but what else can I do to help this ball club? And he put himself in tight end. He worked his craft. And I had a chance to talk to TJ Yates uh, during preseason. He said, Felipe absolutely show what he's about. As, you know, maybe some of the best hands on the team, uh, show some of the physicality sometimes. He said, maybe not right now, the guy you want to put in the three-point stance and says, hey, let's go block this defensive end. But he gives you something in that tight end position and I love that Felipe is willing to do this to help his ball club and to be there for his team. Think about the trickeration that you can come up with with some of these guys. Now, you're going to win consistently in this league with gadget plays. Mm-hmm. But you got Felipe Franks on the field, you got Jared Bernhardt on the field, and you got your starting quarterback <laughs> on the field. All four of those, all three of those guys yeah. can throw it. Yeah. We know they can all run it. Think about some of the little things you right. can weave around. Now, it's just occasionally. Exactly. But it'd be kind of fun to, to make a play with one of those three guys, potentially throwing it to the other guy, or maybe you throw it a couple times. Who knows? And it's – it, Dave – Arch, don't forget about it. You got CP out there as well. So, yes. it's four guys. CP you can hit you in the, deep in the stands with the ball. You know, No, course. it's a great point because, Dave, it's one of those deals where if you just call one or two of them early on yeah. in the season, now you've got everybody around the league, all the defensive coordinators are saying, all right, guys, when they have their team meeting or talking to their defense – They've got three, maybe four guys that can throw the football. So what do you do? You spend practice time on it. You spend film (laughs) session on it, and that's time that they're not spending on something else that's potentially more important. So versatility, the more you can do, as Shock talked about. Now, Dave, you mentioned this. I want to move on and talk a little bit about. So I think our viewers, anyone that's listening or watching, need to understand this. And it's very... 
I say interesting. I talked to the guys before we came on the air that Arthur Smith has been very adamant the last week or so saying that this is going to be our initial 53-man roster. He wants everybody to know inside, outside the building, roster, not on the roster, that your competition is not over with. Because like you said, Dave, as all the other 31 teams release their players, they are they have already been scouring other rosters mm-hmm. and saying, if this guy ends up getting released, could he help us? Is he a better option? Now, to the casual fan, you might say, gosh, that's really cutthroat. And on the outside, yeah, it is, all right? But the NFL can be sometimes. But Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith, their number one job, why they are getting paid is to win football games. And so they are going to construct this roster with the guys that they feel like are going to give them the best chance to win, whether they're in the building now or not. So when I was playing, when DJ was playing, I feel like this day, when you survived this Mm -hmm. day, was a little bit more special because it was like, Gosh, I made the mm-hmm. roster. And maybe yeah. not so much now, Art. So talk through some of the situations that might be happening right now as as Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith have released these players, but they're also looking at 31 other teams and all the players that they've released. Yeah, Terry Fontenot and his staff have been watching, engaging all the other 31 teams. You guys both, you guys both know that. And so what he's done is he's built a table uh, on the board – of guys that potentially going to be available that would fit what they do that might be an upgrade of one of the five, six players that are kept at each position. And if one of those guys becomes available, then you take a shot. Now, it's not that everybody else is not looking at him Correct. too. So there is that part of it. Um, so, yeah, you're, you're, all, you're constantly gauging, is this a guy an upgrade as to what we kept? Don't forget, too, the 16-man practice roster, which I think is, is significant here. Some of the decisions made by Terry and Arthur here might be their strategies involved in this now, where you release a guy that maybe didn't flash or you liked in practice and maybe liked in the game to a certain extent, but maybe didn't necessarily show up on the radar Mm -hmm. of the other 31 teams. That might be a guy you can get back on your practice squad, and all of a sudden he's part of your depth moving forward. Remember, there's a lot more flexibility in being able to get guys, bring guys up off the practice squad. I think you can bring guys as many as three times up off the practice squad without losing them Mm -hmm. or without having to sign them to your regular roster full time. So there's a lot of flexibility there. So that's part of the strategy here, too. That's why the 53 may look completely different a week from today as we get ready to go into the Saint week. Yeah, and the the other thing I think people need to understand and realize that the guys that were released today that potentially could come back onto the practice squad, they're available to all the other 31 teams. So if some of those personnel departments, if some of those uh, coaches did their homework of this guy coming out of college and all of a sudden they're like, oh, X, Y, and Z has now become available as the Atlanta Falcons, that's somewhat risky because this is a guy you're thinking, we're going to sign him to our practice squad. He could get signed, DJ, to somebody else's active roster before they have that opportunity. Yeah, and that's kind of the, the, the big gamble, I should say, is when you let a guy go, especially if he's one guy that you really liked and you said, okay, he's right on the edge of being the guy that maybe he can make our 53, but maybe this guy did something just a tad bit better that gave him the nod. And that's the that's the tricky part about it. And you think about it, there are a couple of guys who made the 53 that you said, maybe those were guys that they, fed up, they put on a practice squad would make another ball clip or somebody would just quickly grab them up. And I think we got to remember, the Falcons had two joint practices. So just like Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith were looking at the Jets and Jaguars, some of their guys, maybe who are on the edge of maybe they don't make the team. If they, you know, join our club, are they guys that could fit us? Guarantee you the Jets and Jags are doing the same thing with the Falcons roster. So there's so many uh, other entities that are looking at uh, this particular team and looking at who was released and said, okay, maybe they fit what we do better than maybe what they did at the Falcons. So this is an interesting time as well to see how many of those guys that the Falcons did release end up going somewhere else, or they say, okay, I'm going to stay here because I think I have a better opportunity to play for these Falcons. you got to remember, these guys have been here, you know, since, you know, draft time. they built equity. They, they you know, learned the system. They learned the guys. And it's tough to, to leave a situation like that, especially when you feel like you had a chance to make the team. So a lot of guys, they're weighing their options as well because just as much as another team may want them, they can decide that maybe I want to be here as Atlanta Falcon on a practice squad better than going somewhere else 
because I got a better chance of playing. You know, one of the sayings that I think was very common when I was playing, I'm sure it was you, Dave, and DJ, and it's it goes – to, to, to right now as well is you got to do your best to be out of that 49 to 53 man positioning on the roster, right? Cause the last three or four are the ones that are always, all right, well, this guy, we can, we can potentially cut him and add this person, right? You're generally safe. If you're the kicker, you're the punter or the long snapper, right? You're generally the safe. If you're the quarterback or the backup starting offensive line, starting position, but then anywhere after that, it's still kind of fair game. So that's why I think it's, it's important that all the, the players know, the coaches have made it evident that competition does not stop. Competition does not stop from this point moving forward because, again, we are still looking for the 53 best players that are going to help us win football games and get to 1-0 and when we start off against the New Orleans Saints. This episode in part brought to you by The Home Depot. Everything you need for your next home improvement project is just a tap away on the Home Depot app. The Home Depot app digital toolbox gives you access to how-to guides, project calculators, and image search so you'll know exactly what you need to pick up. With the tap of the finger, you can rent and reserve the right tools for the job. Also, browse through millions of items from top brands that you can have delivered right to your door. Whatever your project, find exactly what you need with the Home Depot app. Download the Home Depot app today. All right, fellas, let's talk a little strengths and weaknesses as we see on this initial 53-man roster. Arch, I'm going to start with you. Where do you feel like the Falcons are strong, and where do you feel like maybe they could add a player or two to become a little stronger? Yeah, I think it jumps off the page. I talked a little bit about the running back room earlier. I thought that was the deepest room coming into camp, especially with the addition of Tyler Algier out of BYU. They've been nothing but convinced me that that's exactly what it is. The the way they ran the football with conviction downhill, make, punishing people. How about the Algier? run where he shoves it in the end zone this last weekend I think they're in a good spot and I think yep. they've got uh, they've got three guys that can definitely go downhill and tote it and then you got that little guy that can make you miss uh, in Avery Williams uh, from a concern standpoint I think it continues to be one that they'll look at is the corner spot yeah I think the D Alford came on love that I loved what Isaiah Oliver was able to do late uh, in camp came on during the practices against Jacksonville and then, hey took the knee brace off and played against Jacksonville in the game. He almost had interception. That's a guy that I'm expecting to get back on the field, and I think he makes you deeper. Isaiah Oliver says, number one, I'm not 100% yet. Number two, the knee brace is gone. I'm done with it. It's retired, it. and he's ready to move on past that. Dave, you talked about um, the depth of the corner position, and DJ, I wanted to tee you up because this might be an area. They've already added Casey Hayward, as we know, on the roster, but this could be, DJ, an area where if there's a veteran that's released that Terry Fontenot and Arthur Smith feel like can add depth to their cornerback room, do you feel like that's an area where they address? Uh, I think so. I mean, you just look around the NFC South just to be, you know, just starting on your own division. Their receivers go lower at all three teams. And when you have, you know, good positional guys at that position that can play ball, then obviously that fits you better. But when you have, you know, three or four different receivers on a team, you got to have three or four different defensive backs. Not many teams have uh, that many cover guys who have done it and been there and been able to do it. You just talked about Isaiah Oliver being a guy coming off that knee. Well, you know, how quickly can he become the guy that we saw at the end of the year before he got hurt? That's a big, big part of uh, the, the, the secondary. But I think you're, you're good enough in the safety spot where you look at, okay, here's some guys that have played some ball. Uh, here's some guys who have done it before. Richie Grant is a guy who I thought made great strides this preseason but, you know, he's still in an uh, area where he has to grow and become a better player when it comes to game time action. But you got Eric Harris back there who's played a lot of ball. He could kind of mentor those guys. But uh, you guys mentioned that corner spot. In a league where you have so many receivers, I think you can never have enough really good corners that can help you win ball games. Yeah, especially as we see a lot of teams going to the three, four wide receiver sets. You've got to find a way to have guys out there that w have the ability to shut people down, to keep everything in front of them, to knock passes away, and heaven you know, forbid, get interceptions. you got to turn the football over. Uh, I would agree with you guys. I think when you look at the running back room, Dave, it's in a much better position. 
Um, and wide receiver, I know we talked a little bit about is there still some development that needs to happen, but I, I would also say you got to remember that Cordero Patterson ends up playing wide receiver, and you've also got Kyle Pitts playing wide receiver, and those are two guys that have experience and playmaking ability that even though on this roster as it's broken down, their name is not listed as wide receiver, but we're probably going to see them out there, and it does give you a playmaking option outside uh, at the wide receiver position, and obviously once Drake London gets back to 100%, Hopefully he goes out and he ends up realizing the potential that everybody has seen in him because he is a next level wide receiver. So, All right, well, let me ask you two guys questions. Yes. Here. Okay. Are we comfortable at where the offensive line is right now? Because I can guarantee you the fan is thinking offensive and defensive lines, right? That's what yep. we thought about coming in. Are you comfortable with where they are line wise? Certainly Terry feels like some guys flashed for him. Some guys improved like Caleb McGarry. Mm -hmm. Tell me what you guys think. Yeah. You know, I think uh, I'll start with that arch because I know I've been the guy that throughout the off season has been saying that that's an, an area that needs to be addressed. And I don't know if it's been completely addressed. Do I think it could be completely addressed in one year? Probably not. Um, but you know, we're all kind of in the same mold. You guys were quarterbacks played behind an offensive line. Your guys' success was directly dependent on an offensive line. And I kind of, I was a quarterback growing up my whole life, went to college as a quarterback. So I'm always about offensive line. You can't get anything started unless you can run the football on offense. And I was a part of the offenses with Atlanta when we were able yeah. to be a dominant running football. And I saw how everything took off from there. Everything feeds off from being a dominant dominant running uh, football team. Did they do what they needed to as far as bringing some youth and some speed and quickness and shift ability at the running back room? Absolutely. But you still got to be able to open the holes. So am I 100% comfortable that that has been addressed? And not only are they going to be able to open holes, but are they going to protect for these quarterbacks? I'm not yet. So maybe that's an area where if they see a guy that was released, maybe a veteran that's making too much money to another team, but to Atlanta might be one of the diamonds in the rough, if yeah. you will. That could be an area, DJ, where they address and bring in another able, experienced body to help them out up front. Yeah, right. I, I don't think we're going to be 100% uh, all in until we see the progress on the field. And let's be honest. I mean, the last few years, the Falcons have not been up to the standard that you want to protect a franchise guy. And Matt Ryan's been that. Marcus Mariota's coming into this fold. You want to be able to protect him. And that's a big part uh, of this offense, being able to, like you mentioned, create the run lanes, but also be able to protect your quarterback and not being able to get hit. You bring in Jermaine Fetty, You bring in Elijah Wilkinson, two guys who you think have added a little nasty to the group, two guys who were different than last year. So let's see if these guys can help the guys around them and they become a more cohesive unit because this is really what it comes down to. Obviously, we, we've talked about the skill on the outside, the skill at running back and receiver, but can these guys be the catalyst to helping this offense become what everybody wants it to be? So uh, I think only time will tell and – Truly, game day is when we'll be able to say, okay, we can see a difference. We can see this team becoming better offensively because of those guys up front. And I, and I will say this. I will I will come back and, and add on. And I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago. I feel like the change at the quarterback position is going to help the offense because – this is nothing against Matt Ryan. I was probably one of the biggest Matt Ryan fans that we had. I felt like he can still help an NFL franchise. But as of right now, it's just not the right fit for his skill set, his strengths and weaknesses, and where they're at as an offensive line. But now you have Mariota and even Desmond Ritter, guys that have a little bit more mobility. Now they've got the ability to make that first man miss if you do have a, a breakdown in, in, in communication up front. If there's a breakdown in technique up front and you get somebody through, now you have a little bit more escapability with the two quarterbacks on the roster that now you still have a chance to make something positive whereas with Matt back there it might have been an 8 to 10 yard loss just because the mobility wasn't there to get away from some of the pass rush would you agree Dave with yeah, the, this switch no, no question um, none of us are trying to bad mouth the guy that was the best quarterback in this franchise's yeah. history this guy's in my opinion he's a Hall of Fame football player so let's leave that where it is we don't need to apologize for saying we've moved on from that um, what it does, it also, you mentioned the off-schedule stuff both these guys are going to be able to do. Think about the on-schedule stuff from a play call standpoint that Arthur Smith has available to him yeah. now. To be able to move the launch point for the quarterback, to be able to get him outside and dual threat things with run and pass. Yep. Those are all going to be things that slow a defense down, slow a pass rush down. And you know we all played against defenses. If you can get them to hesitate a count, 
All of a sudden, I'm ahead of them. I got to step, right? Whether it's a receiver, a run, a block. If I can get them to hesitate, and I think the quarterback's going to help them do that. All right, folks, so that's – that's. oh, go ahead, DJ, go ahead. Well, well, one quick point. I think ours brings up something that's really critical. And one thing that's – I think a lot of defenses are going to keep in the back of their mind when they play this team is – we got to rush the right way because this guy has shown already in preseason he can make you pay. So now you're talking about hesitating just a little bit. You come into a ball game and a defensive line knows, oh, if I get too far afield or I don't rush the right way, this guy's going to hurt me. So guess what? That's going to help your offensive line. That's going to help you have a little bit more time because this guy's going to be more conscious of – Oh, this quarterback can be anywhere on the field at any given time. So now I have to know how to rush the passer. So now there is going to be a slight hesitance to how you rush this passer, how you go and attack this Falcons offense, because, you know, that guy back there can make some guys miss in space. Yeah, and I'll say this, too. Let's let's be real now. The double-edged sword of that is – that whether it's Marcus or Desmond in the game at some point during the season, you've got to squeeze the trigger when it when it's supposed to come oh, out. Yeah. You yeah. can't be someone that's holding it. Now I'm looking to create mm-hmm. because now that's not the – most of these offenses are timing offenses where the ball comes. Love that he can do stuff off schedule and love that we can, we can call things for them to do stuff like that. But when it calls for a slant route to come out or a bang at post to come out or you got to get to your top step and hit that corner in between the, uh, in between the corner and the safety in that little – dead hole mm-hmm. when you're trying to get that little bend out that ball's got to come out on time so those guys have to understand we're not trying to create every play right. there's a lot of timing involved it's got to get the ball out that athleticism <laughs> on those certain routes dj has to be secondary right yeah, yeah i mean it just one last thing and i think that's why we were so excited and me and arch was so pumped about the touchdown to oz because we know he can make the off schedule plays we know we've seen that but the play to OZ was a timing play. He had That ball had to come out. He had to lay it in the zone. He had to lay it in the area. OZ went and got it. That's the kind of stuff that excites us because we know he can do the other stuff. But seeing that just gives you proof that this offense can be that way as well. I can feel it, guys. The excitement. It's starting to come out because they know real football. No offense to preseason, <laughs> but real football is on the horizon. Because you know what? It was vanilla in the preseason. We only saw starters for like half a minute, okay? Now we're going to get a chance to see Kyle Pitts, Marcus Mariota, Drake London, the rest of all these playmakers, not only going the entire 60 minutes, but with the full playbook, with the full creativity, and I'm looking forward to it. I and can the see it. Saints are coming. I know, to right? What? Let's start it off. Let's get it going. Let's go. Okay. All right. So oh. that's going to uh, wrap it up for our initial 53 man roster. By the time we end up coming back next week, could this thing different. could look a whole lot different. Sure we could have two different people. We could have 10 or 15 different people on this roster. I don't know yet. But what I am excited about is regular season football is on the horizon. Are you excited as well? We appreciate you joining us here on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. This is the initial 53-man roster edition, and we are ready to play some football. DJ, I appreciate you joining us from, from down the interstate a little bit. I know you got some work to do a little bit later, but we appreciate you joining us. Dave, as always, good to see you, and we appreciate you guys joining us on the Falcons Audible presented by AT&T. Don't forget, like, subscribe, review on Spotify, iTunes, AtlantaFalcons.com, or YouTube, or how however you end up getting your podcast material. Thanks, everyone. We'll be back very soon with a whole lot more Atlanta Falcons coverage. Take care.